Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Since his first role in I'm Gonna Get You Sucka to his time on In Living Color, as well as all of the parody movies. I mean, all of them. I can't, I can't name them all right now. Marlon Wayans is, at this point, an indelible piece of American popular culture. His new stand-up special on Netflix, Wokish, finds Marlon just as funny as ever, but now pondering what he's still allowed to laugh at. Let's take a look. I call myself woke, but not all the way. I'm up, nigga, but I'm not. I'm wokeish. <laughs> no, but I still party. I'm like an old young nigga. Like, try and chase it like, hey, and your old ass gets stuck down there. He goes, Dad, listen, I can't play great every night. I said, motherfucker. That's my little nickname for him. He little motherfucker, I'm big motherfucker. Trump is the flavor flame of white people. <laughs> hey, bucko. This shit is crazy. Oh, no. Yeah. Barack Obama winning the presidency was the first time we, as black people, felt like we won. See, that in the OJ trial. But see, we knew that nigga did it all. Everybody, please welcome Marlon Wayans. Thank you. Sir, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How y'all doing? Hey, how y'all doing? How y'all doing? Got an interesting crowd right there. What do you yeah, what do you think about this crowd? Somebody wake him up. <laughs> you like, you like you was at like somewhere like on the bus and it's like, yeah, you want to be on the show? He said, yeah. Just leave me the fuck alone. <laughs> sure, come on. And you got a Superman shirt on? Yeah, this is interesting, this crowd. <laughs> y'all are interesting, folks. How y'all doing? Interesting is a very vague word that you could you, you could you It's could just a nice, in uh, uh, like, mix? like, mix of people. You got a brother with blue blockers on, or uh, uh, making fun of somebody blind, apparently. <laughs> no, but it's an interesting crowd. Good crowd, good crowd. Marlon, uh, talk to me about, about, about Wokish. You know, you've been doing uh, acting, you've been writing and, and, and starring in, uh, in the movies for so long. Uh, is this really, is this your first special in some time? My first stand-up special ever. This is ever. the first time I'm introducing to the world, hey, Marlon Wayans does stand-up comedy as well. It's a, it's a whole different genre. People are like, you mean to tell me you don't do, you don't do it already? No, nah, I've only been doing it seven years. And it's a completely different art form. It's kind of like going from like learning uh, piano to going to guitar. It takes time to figure it out before you go, okay, I'm ready to show the world that I do this. And I've been touring doing like clubs and things like that, but I'm trying to get to theaters and, 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 uh, and, and concerts. So um, I put out my, my first special and it's been an amazing response. It's really um, funny, it's really thank great. You. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Let's talk about what I'm made you- I'm just happy I didn't em embarrass my family because them. Them, them niggas are gonna make me a different family name for a second. They almost sent me to the Kardashians twice. Not a bad family. I mean, it's a lucrative family. To yeah, yeah lucrative, but you work. gotta sell your soul to get there. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, what made you seven years ago decide that you wanted to do stand up? Uh, I just wanted to get better. Um, I, 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 I've been in the industry for a long time. And kind of born in the industry in a lot of ways, right? I mean, I mean it wasn't like, hey, bah, ha, <laughs> give me a line. Uh, it, it How was, old were you when you when you got your first on-screen appearance? I was uh, uh, 11 years old. Right. Uh, my brother did I'ma Get You Sucker, and he flew me out for the summer, and I was an extra, and he gave us some lines. We was talking to Fly Guy, and, um, and so that was my first part. He cut the part. And so all you hear is like me, you see me and Sean at 12 and 13 years old, walking down the street, uh, laughing at Fly Guy. Um, and then uh, I got, and then I went to perform in arts high school and I was auditioning for movies and I would get them. Really? But I, would, I graduated and I went to Howard University, but I wasn't gonna leave school until I got the right role. So I got the role, I, got, I was getting movie after movie and I was like, no, nah, I don't wanna do that. No, it's not, not for me, no. Are you really? Yeah, you were landing? too much integrity. No, yeah, I was, I was crazy. You were landing these auditions at like 20 years old and you wouldn't leave school to go? I was booking 90% of everything I was going in can for. Can I ask, was anything uh, made that you can say you, you initially booked but you didn't go on? Uh, there was a movie called Fathers and Sons that, I, uh, that my boy Mitchell wound up doing. Everything I didn't do, my boys wound up doing. <laughs> Uh, my uh, juice. There was a, an interest for me for juice. Um, there was a bunch of like bunch of movies, and I was like, no, no, no. And then I, I went to college, and then I got the and then Mo Money came up, yeah. and Damon was like, um, initially, 
I'm gonna be honest, you a little too ugly for this part. Um, I wanna give it to Kadeem Hardison. Cause he's famous and you're not. But if you can go in, and then Kadeem said no. And then he was, then Damon calls me up and he filled me with insecurity again. He goes, all right, so the role's available, but I wanna give it to Claude Brooks. Cause I know he looked like me in the face, although he got pretzel ears. He looks like me in the face. But if you come in and you're real funny, you may get the part. Just think about making me laugh. And Damon's the hardest person to make laugh. And so I went in there and I rewrote all his stuff and you know the nerve of me, I punched up Damon's <laughs> script and I went in there and I, I, I got the part. And he was like, he was pretty funny. I was like, thank you. And then he gave me the part, and that was, uh, that was history. Now, I, now, I'm curious, you know, I think the, the Waynes family, all of the projects that you guys have been a part of and done together, it's always, I think, assumed that it's, it's uh, a family affair because that's what you want. But are, are you guys actually kind of cutthroat with each other and auditioning for each other? Um, we're real. Like, if you're new in the game, we're not going to give you the part. You got to audition. You got to show us that, yo, you, you, first of all, it's not even about the audition. You have to be prepared for the moment because otherwise we're setting you up to fail. This industry is hard. And the one thing that you have to do is you have to prepare. So like Lil Damon got the role in, um, in uh, a dance flick over Kevin Hart. But Lil Damon had been doing stand-up for so long, and he was, you know, really funny. So we, he got the part. He auditioned, and he got the part. Um, we're not going to set you up for failure. This industry is too hard, so you have to be prepared for what you're about to get into. So, you know. Yeah. When you jumped on uh, Mo Money, did you, did you end up sort of punching it up as well when you got on set? There's a line. I told you in the green room that Mo Money was actually the first VHS tape yes. that I owned. You said you were seven, and that... You watch Mo Money. And all the time. I watch it all the time. I knew it by heart. And then I looked at all your gray in your face, and I said, are you sure you were seven? <laughs> and not 7D at the time? Could have been. I was like, are you in your second term of presidency? How you get this much? <laughs> How am I 13 years older than you, and you got all this gray? You, you, life is worrying you, man. There was um, a, a line in the film that you gave me as a seven or eight-year-old, like a complex. You say to the white guy in it, uh, all white people look the same to me and smell like baloney. <laughs> and when I was like... I you in school uh, like this, like... Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> hey, Sarah, come here. Do I smell like baloney? No, that's what I was She's doing. She's like, no, for, more like wet chicken. For no. years, I was like, do I... I think white, white people smell like baloney. Do I smell like baloney? <laughs> Bologna? <laughs> no, they don't all smell like like bologna. Like just some of the kids in my neighborhood smell like bologna. Because then again, that's the only meat we eat when you're in the projects is bologna. What is bologna, by the way? Is it pork? Is it ham? Is, what, is it goat? All of it. I think it's the trails from the floor just that's crunched just... up. It's disgusting. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> She's like, oh, I just fried some up this morning. When, uh, after Mo Money, how did you get on In Living Color? Was that like a thing of like, okay, you were great on Mo Money, we can bring you into In Living Color now, or another instance where you had to audition and prove yourself? Well, that was because um, I, I, was, I did Mo Money, and I, was a, uh, I got a lot of heat off Mo Money, and then I got the role of Batman, for, and Batman Forever, I got the role of Robin. And so my brother was just like, Keenan was like, mm, this stupid asshole's gonna be somebody. <laughs> And uh, he put me on Living Color as a featured player. And me and Sean, that's the first time we started doing like sketches together. Me and Sean used to do sketches together when we was kids. But that's the first time we started doing stuff together, me and Sean. Prior to that, Sean was the DJ. He was SW1, right? Yeah, he was lip-syncing DJing. That boy wasn't DJing. <laughs> the Millie Vanilli of DJing. <laughs> but what's crazy is now he knows how to DJ. Really? Yeah, he was like, I'm tired of them thinking I can't scratch. So now Sean's learning how to DJ. <laughs> What was it like at the, when, at the young age of fifty? This man is DJing. Good. What was it like when you, when the two of you decided to do "Don't Be a Menace"? That's your first film that the two mm -hmm. of you sort of wrote. And mm -hmm. and did you direct that or did Keenan direct no. that? I don't remember. Um, Excuse Ke me. Keenan, Keenan kind of. Well, Paris Buckley directed it, and Keenan directed the reshoots, which became like what "Don't Be a Menace." Oh, really? Is, yeah. What had what had, what happened there? What had happened? What had happened uh, there? It just was two different tastes and humor. You know, Paris, you know, a great dramatic director, but when it come to, came to comedy, uh, for our taste, it wasn't, it wasn't getting the, the capturing what we wanted. Uh, Sean and I was, you know, um, and then we cut it together. The movie wasn't playing like we hoped it to play. And so we rewrote, like, a whole script 
in two weeks, and we took and shot like 60 pages of material in two weeks. And most of that is what became Don't Be a Menace. So My what, brother Keenan directed that part. What was it like for you and Sean having that be your first experience making a movie? Was that exciting? Was it it's, stressful? It, it, it's all stressful because Keenan made us do, well, we did 19 drafts of Don't Be a Menace before we even took it to the studio. And then once we got to the studio, we took, did another five drafts. And then after that, we had to do these rewrites because to, to get the movie where we needed to be. So Keenan put us through, through the ringer. There was no easy steps. It wasn't like we wrote one thing and he, no. Keenan, Keenan he, he grinded us, and, which is good because, you know, it, it really, the art of writing is rewriting. Yeah. It's not about, yo, how funny is this first joke? It's how funny can you be, you know, how can you top that joke? And if it all goes to hell, can you rewrite a whole new script? and put it on his feet and rock it. And so that's that's what, you know, this industry is. A lot of times, I'm on a TV show right now, Marlon, we rewrite all week long. Even on the floor, when we're finally filming on Thursday, we are rewriting jokes going, all right, that joke didn't play. Everybody huddle up. All right, da, 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 da. All right cool. And you go out and you do a new joke, and that, that's the art of, of, of comedy. Yeah. And when you, was it New Line that did Don't Be a Menace? Was that that the... was, um, um, uh, that was, Miramax. Oh, was it, Mir it was Miramax? Yeah, actually, it was originally wow. Island Pictures. Um, and it was Island Pictures, which was uh, Bob Marley's old manager. What's his name? It's And Island Mark Records. Greenberg, yes. But the guy who gave us the money, really great. Chris, oh, man, damn it. I hate the fact that I'm forgetting his name because uh, he deserves a thank you. But he's... The white guy that was with Bob Marley, his manager, and he gave us the money to do it, uh, Don't Be a Menace. And then Miramax picked it up as a, as a negative pickup. What was it like pitching Don't Be a Menace? Because, what I mean, at that period, it was like 97, 96. Like but Keenan had I'm Gonna Get You Sucker. Right. And he had a living color. So Keenan godfathered us and, and was like, okay, I got this. These guys are young. I'm a shepherd the project. And, and he did. But you're pitching a, a parody of... Movies. No, we wrote a script. It wasn't a pitch. We wrote a we wrote a script. Like just it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't like we wrote we wrote a script and they read the script and the script was edgy because it was making fun of hood movies and we had I mean we had this one scene where uh, uh, one of the guys gets shot and there's so much blood. <laughs> that somebody's jet skiing on the blood in the house. Like, it was crazy, and it was very edgy. And, um, but, you know, the, 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 the Island Records for, uh, pictures thought it was funny, and they gave us some money to do it, and then uh, uh, Miramax picked it up, and then we did the reshoots, and, and that was Don't Be a Menace. Well, it's one of those things where I, I think back to the time, and, you know, uh, Boys in the Hood, Menace Society, Juice, all of those movies were taken very seriously oh, yeah. and were still considered, I think, by the sort of whites that ran the studios, very a limited audience. And Absolutely. probably not that profitable to 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 make and huge risks. Yeah. But then to take the risk of making a kind of parody movie of those movies that are already in their minds, I assume they assume they were, they were very niche movies. Yeah, it, it was. And it was a, a, a big gamble. But, you know, me and Sean, we were always hard workers. So when we went on a promotional tour, we did a promotional tour. We went to all these different states, and we did every morning talk show. We, we grinded. We worked. And Don't Be a Menace opened in a blizzard, a snowstorm. We made the movie, I think, it was for like five, initially for like three. They gave us some more money to reshoot. So we was in about maybe five, maybe, maybe less. Um, Don't Be a Menace opened. To twelve point, I believe seven million dollars in a snowstorm back in nineteen ninety four, right. which was unheard of. Like, and then the next week, you know, it f it fell off a little bit. But the fact that we made our budget back and then some, it was crazy. I mean, that was a phenomenal win for us. Do you take? Uh, I imagine you still take that work ethic that you had for Don't Be Menace into starting stand up seven years ago. I when take it, the work ethic. Everything is work. Everybody's like, what? Like you know, when people go, oh, you're not talented. Talent is hard. It's not like, oh, I'm naturally good at something. Talent is how hard are you willing to work to get great at something. 
And are you willing to fail? Are you willing to not be good? Are you willing to stink? And it's funny because I know I'm, I'm doing my career ass backward. I'm supposed to have started in stand up, <laughs> but I was always like, I came up as an actor and my brothers did stand up and I was like, stand up comedians talk about their pain. I don't really have much pain. I, I, grew up, uh, I grew up poor, but I was like less poor than my brothers was poor because they made money and helped the family out. And I was just like, and then Damon had a twisted foot. And I was like, I can't make my foot club. So he got all this pain. And, you know, and <laughs> Keenan got a lot of beatings. And I, and I, I had a good life. I had a good life. And, but then I was like, and, and then I was like, but that's not what I want to do. I want to be different. I want to be an actor. So I went to performing arts high school. And my thing was I wanted to be the actor in the family. But I was naturally funny. And you so, are also a very good actor. I mean, I think to like Requiem for a Dream, like I, your, your sort of major dramatic performance, and you're phenomenal in that. Thank you. Though. Thank you. I, yeah. You know, for performing arts high school, they teach you like Juilliard teaches you. This is like intense acting. Like you got to be an animal. Like I was a monkey for like seven days. Like they, they make you work. Like um, so, and they make you talk about your pain and get to really know what's going on inside of you and why you are the way you are. And so, you know, the dramatic arts is what I was taught, but comedy was always what I loved to do. So stand-up was something that I, I was like, that's my brother's lane. And then um, I auditioned for the role. Well, first I got the movie, my brother Damon's movie, Behind the Smile, which he never put out. But my brother got my Oscar in his closet. Um, I love you, but uh, can you release that one day, please? Why won't he release it? I don't know why Damon do what he do. Damon crazy. Mm. I'm a, I don't like the deal. I'm going to put that in my closet. I'm going to let my granddaughter play Fisbee with the DVD. <laughs> Damon crazy. But, you know, it was a great film. It's one of, uh, Damon, we, we showcased it at, um, what was it, uh, in Utah at uh, Sundance. And all the comedians saw it. Dave Chappelle was like, it's my favorite movie ever. I love that movie. The way you blew your face off, butt naked on the stage. Oh, man, Marlon, I love that movie. Love it, nigga. And so um, he never released it. And then, so I did stand up for that because it was about a comedian. So the, the, the actor in me brought me to stage, uh, the method actor in me. So then um, I got an audition for the role of Richard Pryor. Oh. And so when I went up for that audition, I started going up and doing stand up because I was like, if I'm gonna play the greatest comedian ever, then I gotta get my black ass on stage and prepare for this. And that version of the movie I wound up getting, it was me and Bill Condon was directing. So I got the movie. So I started doing stand-up. And then the movie kind of went away because of budgetary reasons or whatever. But the movie never happened. And then it wound up being Mike Epps with, uh, what's his name, uh, from Empire. Lee Daniels was going to direct. But now the movie, who knows what's happening. It, Mike Epps. I think they're making it, Mike Epps. But I don't remember who's directing it. I don't, I don't think the movie's Fuck, I would have loved to see you play Richard Pryor. I mean, Bill but here's directed. the thing. I don't even think it's, it's happening right now. But the beauty of that story is, and this is... This is alchemy. Um, I, Pryor, who's my comedic idol, brought me, doing his life story, brought me to the stage as an actor. It made me, my acting brought me to the stage. But then I didn't want to get in a part. And I realized I didn't want to, it was God. It was like, I don't want to play a great, I want to be a great. And so I started doing stand-up comedy, and it's changed me and my perspective on my life and the world and myself. And I think as an artist, I'm maturing. I'm paying more attention. I'm listening better. And, and that's the beauty of, of alchemy and of staying consistent in your journey. You don't know where this journey in any, any career you're going to take. You don't know where it's going to bring you. You just got to keep walking, and you just got to keep doing. And the more you do, the better you get. And I... I don't, I don't, I still don't know where I'm going, but I'm feeling a lot more comfortable. I got my feet under me and I, f I feel like I'm getting better and I'm maturing and I'm growing. And it's a beautiful thing for me to, to see. I used to always, when my kids was born, I started playing piano and because I wanted my kids to see me suck at something and learn and get good because I wanted them to know that if you work hard, and you practice that you can be anything you want to be and as great as you want to be if you're willing to do the work. 
Because my kids, when they, when they were born, I was already famous. I was successful. I was doing white chicks. I was making lots of money to do movies. And they never saw me suck at something. So I started doing piano. And I still suck at piano. <laughs> but I thought that was the thing that they was going to see me get great at. But when they were like somewhere in the middle of their life, when I was, they was like seven, eight, I started doing stand-up comedy. And I used to come home and watch the tapes and they used to see me like suck. And for me to do it and to present a special about my life and the world and my kids, they look at that and they go, Dad, that's your greatest accomplishment. Because I remember when you used to suck. <laughs> they're honest with you. Yeah, they're very honest with me. And I'm honest with them and I tell all their business in the streets. So don't do no dumb shit. You know what's going to go on stage. It's a huge detriment to the to to a child to not be surrounded by people who are evolving and constantly changing and working to better themselves. Absolutely, you know? children, children are funny because they see what you do. You could say all the things you want to say to them, but they watch your actions. Like my daughter, I put a piano in the house every now and then. I'll go play it. I'm not great. That little girl, she down there playing. She's singing. Bought her a ukulele. She play, picked it up. I bought her a guitar 10 years ago. It had dust on it. Two years, a year, this year, she picked it up, started playing. And it's funny. You just got to introduce these kids to things. And my daughter could act. She could write. She could sing. She could, uh, she's an, she could do art. She's dope. Like, I, if, I, I, if I was a manager, I would pimp the hell out of her. <laughs> She's going to be managers watching Marlon's <laughs> daughter. Oh, she's going to be somebody. If, jo if I was Joe Jackson, Lord. <laughs> but, my, but, but she's, she's special. And my son, he plays basketball. This man practices like he's in the NBA. He, like, he does his studying. He works. He does his, all his stuff. He works out. Then he goes home and shoots baskets outside. I put him a little black basket outside He's in, in, in the driveway. He shoots. He goes, takes his, 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 his uh, clinics with his coach. You know, it's all about hard work. My kids know hard work because they see daddy bust his ass every day. I, this is hard work. And for anybody, I, we just make it look fun. Not just bust his ass for one thing, but bust his ass to change and, oh, sorry, to change and evolve and, uh, you know, become uh, always a different and better person as you get older. No, fuck that. I did that to feed they little ass. <laughs> Let's break it down. I did all this to feed you good steak. So if you didn't if you if, if you didn't have the kids, you wouldn't have tried to find stand up, you wouldn't have continued making movies. Oh uh, nah, I'd have been real, real, real relaxed with that white chick's check. Like yeah, uh, say, kick it on uh, the uh, stand ups for the up. poor. I don't them kids, you put them in private school, boy, you get you get to work. Them <laughs> bills, they give you college bills in the sixth grade. You like, what? <laughs> Sometimes I go home, I'll be like, you know what? Here's I know there's some rocket parts. What's that, Dad? Here's some plutonium, some de Build me a fucking rocket, because I want to know why I'm paying $50,000 for school. <laughs> you should be, you better be learning rocket science. Right, and they're all going to become entertainers after high school. And like, <laughs> I know, and I wasted it. all this damn money in private school. I could have sent you to public school, got your ass beat a couple of times. But you know, that's where, greater, that's where the art. great stand-up comes from. What was, uh, you said you would go Hold home. on, it's hot. Nah, this jacket is fly. You ever wear some fly shit and then realize how hot you are? Like, I'm, I smell like gyro meat up here. Fried <laughs> bologna. Oh, uh, you said that uh, you would go home and you would watch the tapes and you wouldn't be, uh, you want to Uh, you would watch the tapes. What was your worst experience doing stand-up, learning? Uh, Do you uh, remember your worst gig? Uh, they keep coming. Uh, <laughs> you never know what gig you're going to get. You know, I, I, my worst gig was, uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So when you do stand-up, like, you need, like, a darkened space. You need, like, a spotlight, a stage. You need the attention to be on you, everybody quiet and focused. Because listening leads to laughter. If there's noise, it's hard to be funny. I did this gig. First of all, it was a religious uh, gig in Arkansas. It was like a Baptist church. And it was like, you just got to be clean. I was like, how clean? They was like, you could say a couple of, you know, damn and, you know, stuff like that. I said, like, OK, cool. So I go to the gig, and my niece is opening for me. And my niece, it, it, she's gay, right? 
and she's supposed to open. And they look, took one look at her. She has the, the hat. <laughs> she dressed like a little boy. She got the little hat on and the cornrows and, you know. And um, they did one look at her and they said, oh, he, he ain't going on, is he? I said, we remember. Yeah, she, he, whatever that. I said, my niece? Oh, yeah, she definitely ain't going on here. These people ain't going to understand that. They, they're not going to understand, like, the gay in Arkansas? No, we, we don't do that. I said, okay. And I looked at the place, and it was a, so now I don't have an opener. And I'm doing this, I'm in this place, and this is like a, a big stadium. And the lights are all on. They don't have a stage. They have five microphones set up and music in back of me, and I'm just like, and no spotlight. And I went, okay, this is not going to work. Why? And they said, what, what you going to talk about? And I got, like, edgy material, mm -hmm. but I was, like, not going to curse. I said, well, I had this bit about religion. Oh, no, we, we don't talk about God unless it's about worship. I said, okay. Um, <laughs> What else you got? I said, I got this, this thing about Michael Jordan and how great he is and how when he dunks, sometimes the, the penis lands on the other guy's face. And he said, oh, no, we, we, don't, we don't do penis. Mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. Penis ain't in the Bible, son. Uh, and I said, all right, so basically this is, I bailed out. I said, this isn't going to work. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the raffle, and I'm going I'm to I'm I'm have fun. And I'm going to do your raffle thing, and we're going to do the auction and all that. And I'm going to give you half this money back. But I'm not about to come up here and sweat for an hour with nobody listening and talking about things. So I don't want you to get thrown out your own church, okay, because I'm going to say some ungodly shit right now. Just the fact that I put God and shit next to each other shows you what kind of uh, indecency I'm about to do. God don't shit. God said, don't mm, no, no, and God poos. Yeah. And so I, 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 bailed, I bailed out the gear. I gave half their money back, and I was like, nah, because my brothers, Sean and Keenan, came in my head. See, my brothers taught me. See, me, I always thought I could just be funny. I'll wing it. I'll do it. My brothers are very strategic about comedy. They look at the room. They look at the audience. And I was young and new to comedy. They would have known not to even get on the plane for that gig. Me, I had to learn. My brother always says, you know, sometimes you don't listen. You're a funny guy. You're just hard-headed. I thought you was raining outside, and you go get wet. <laughs> and I told him I, that it's not that I don't believe it's not raining. I believe you when you say it's raining outside. But I just want to dodge raindrops. I want to, if it's possible, I want to dodge raindrops. And so he goes, mm, go ahead. And that's my thing is I don't, I, I'm basically saying I don't want to be afraid to fail. And I got to find my way, doing it my way. And unfortunately, sometimes with big brothers, you know, they want to protect you. And sometimes the best thing for a little brother is for him to fall flat on his face and learn the lesson himself. I'm curious, uh, I brought up Requiem for a Dream a minute ago, uh, and it's a great dramatic performance, uh, and you said that you might have, you almost played prior. Is there a part of you that wants to do more dramatic performances? Do you go out for them uh, a lot? I, I don't really know, but if a great one came along, I would. Like, Requiem, I auditioned six times, because Darren and Oscar was like, oh, I don't want to do uh, anybody in, that's on the Frog Network in uh, my, my movie. I was on the WB. He was like, no, no, no. He couldn't believe I could act like I act. And I just kept doing, going in, kept going in, kept going in. And he I, praised and I, you after when that movie came out. He was, in, he was in love with you as an actor. That's, he's still a friend of mine to this day. And then, you know, we went through the journey. He made me walk around New York City, but like damn near like my shirt off in February. I said, why, why are we doing this? I want you to remember that when we're filming in, ju in June, uh, it's wintertime. I want you to remember how cold it is. I said, motherfucker, I grew up in New York. I know how cold it is. He's such a, he does, I feel like he does that to all of his actors. It's such a sadist. He, put, he puts us through it. Yeah. And, um, you know, but I do want to do more dramatic work. I, I have dramatic chops, and I would love to. People don't understand. It's not that I, I don't want to do drama. I just choose to do comedy because I find that it's so much harder to do than drama. I, I can hurt. I got, we all got pain. But to take your pain 
and flip it and take your pain and make other people smile and feel better about their life and their pain that they're going through that's similar to the pain that you're experiencing or whatever you're doing and you're, you're bringing joy and laughter to their face, that's why God put me here. That is my purpose. My purpose is I'm in the business of smiles. And I will do drama too, like even on my TV show, I, even in my special, Wokish, there's moments where I sit in the pocket and I'm, I'm real. But then I flip it and I go, all right, so I make you laugh and cry in the same moment, boom, that's a beautiful day. Let's get some questions from our audience. Who's a question out here? Right here. Hi, I'm a big fan of you. What's work. up, brother? Thank you. I wanted to know, out of all your brothers, who do you think is the funniest and what inspires you at this moment? Um... That's a tough one. I think me and my brothers were all funny in different ways. I just have a funny family. And if I had to say who's the funniest in my family, I'm going to say my mom. But if I had to go between my brothers, I think we're all equally funny differently. We all have strengths. You know, it's like uh, Keenan is very, he understands the science of comedy extremely well. Damon is a, uh, a, like a beast on the stage, just understands how to take the darkest thing and go, here's what's funny about this. Sean is probably the most underrated comedian ever. That man is brilliant. One of my favorite comedians, Sean. He is hilarious and constantly on the road. Uh, me, I think my physicality and my versatility and the fact that we all do characters, so it's so hard to go which one of us is uh, the best. I think with, with comedians, we're all snowflakes. Um, you're never going to find one alike. Um, but that, and that's the beauty. You, you know, hopefully, you, know, you find one that you do go, this one's for me. Um, and in terms of what inspires me, um, I wake up with inspiration every day. Sometimes I'm in the shower and I go, oh, I got this joke. And I get out the shower and I go find a pen and I write the joke down. And I go, okay. It's, I don't know. It's like when I'm on stage and I'm in the middle of a joke that I always do and something new hits me. It's kind of like God whispers in your ear. You don't say this. <laughs> and you just say it. And I, it comes out of nowhere. It comes in every moment. It comes in conversation. Somebody walks in a room. You look at him and go, oh, his was funny. Yeah, talk about how old he looks, even though he said he's young. <laughs> I swear. I Cut the beard. <laughs> Cut the beard. Cut the beard. <laughs> so inspiration, I, I, I always chalk inspiration up to God, to the higher being, to a higher power. And, and that's inspiration to me. Did you guys... Um... Did you and your brothers, uh, I mean, really your family, when you were all working together on In Living Color and then on the movies, did you guys ever fight in any ways, get into creative disputes with each other? And how did that affect all of the crew who weren't part of your family? All the time. But we, we never, we don't have public fights and public spats. We oh, wow. go in the room and we talk about it. And we, we don't, normally we don't, even like when we're angry, we always say, I love you. And that love you could be fuck you but I love you. Yeah, I love you. Yeah, I love you too. <laughs> and that's just the way we argue. I mean, there's nothing that, to me, will ever separate me and my brothers. And whatever we go through, you know, uh, argument or whatever, family's going to do that. And ain't no family, there's no family that does not fight, that does not argue. That's what you're supposed to do because you're supposed to question people. You're supposed to challenge people. Um, to make them better, you need challenge. You need yin and yang. And so... Um, we're never afraid of those artistic battles, and usually the oldest wins. And what happens is eventually, if you don't trust that, you go do it your own way and find what works for you. And me and my brothers worked together a long time, and a lot of what they've always told me kind of stuck with me. But I always said, that's what y'all think. I'm going to do this anyway. <laughs> and sometimes I fell flat on my face. And then sometimes I learned to fly a different way. And... When I, I, I can always go, yeah, I did fall, but I learned to fly. You know, somewhere along the way, I learned to fly. Mm -hmm. And the beauty is now I can come back and I can show y'all these new maneuvers and tricks I did. And that's just the way generations work and family works. And so, you know, I, I know my brothers love me and uh, my sisters love me and they always want to protect me. But sometimes I just, I'm, I just, I just got to see if I can fly. I got to dodge raindrops. Next question. 
Hi, Marlon. Hi, baby. I enjoyed you and White Chicks, and Thank you. Um, that's like one of my favorite movies um, that you and your brother did. But I wanted to ask you, I saw you in G.I. Joe, and um, that was my first time getting to see you do a serious role. And I wanted to know if you would actually consider doing another um, role that's serious and longer. Um, absolutely. I want to do more, especially action. I want to do more action. I would love to, I'm, I'm developing an action comedy right now. But that's what, that's what I want to do. I want my 48 Hours. I want my Beverly Hills Cop. I, I want to do uh, action comedies, uh, definitely. And, and, and even some that's just action. You know, I would love to have the versatility to do it all. You know, like Robin Williams did it all. And, you know, um, and, 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 you know, actors of that caliber with that kind of Jim Carrey do it all. You know, um, uh, that's what I'm, I'm working toward, and that's why I'm doing the specials, and that's why I'm doing my TV show, and that's why I go on the road, because I'm just creating opportunity for myself, because one day you become that undeniable, undeniable international megastar. And so if I never become that, I know that that's the journey that I'm on, and I work hard every day to achieve that. Next question. What was the most difficult thing, thing to do in general? Was it comedy or mostly drama? Uh, comedy is always going to be the hardest. Uh, drama, drama, it, it's it's all beats and it's all feelings and it's all emotions. I'm not saying it's easy, but for me, drama is easier than comedy. Comedy, I got to think funny. I got to be on my toes. There's an audience in front of me. It's in the moment. You give a dramatic actor a microphone and 300 people and watch him freeze up. Watch talk shows. The comedians are always the funniest when they sit on the couch. It's when the dramatic guy has to work in front of an audience. They get all nervous. Their palms sweat. And, and for, for me, comedy is way harder. So I, I love the challenge of comedy. Yeah, I'd love to see De Niro take on a uh, stint. <laughs> he, De Niro, watch him on Leno. He's the, on one of them shows. Yeah. The, uh, he gets all shy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, baby. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> she crept up on you. Really yeah. did. You, oh, hey. <laughs> startled. Me. Hey, Marlon. Hi, babe. The first time I actually saw you was when you were touring NYU for like last year. So that oh, was pretty yeah, cool. Oh yeah, I was taking my daughter to yeah. see schools. Yeah. No, I currently go there for film, so that was pretty cool. Oh yeah. Um, the question I had for you was, how do you actually balance like your career and fatherhood? Um. Well, I I, I make sure uh, my kids. First of all, they they get dad. They know dad has a purpose, dad has stuff to do, and they're teenagers. They don't want me around anyway. I'm, I'm messing up their game. Right now, they 16 and 17. I'm, I'm like, they, don't, they ain't trying to hang with me. And I'm try, trying to break the news to their mama. You better get a life, because them kids, <laughs> two years from now, you're going to be begging. They'll be like, mom, chill, leave me alone. Um, and, and so for me, they understand, even when I'm out and fans come up and they want to talk, and I get, I get upset sometimes because I, I don't have that much time to spend with my children. I, I just want to spend time, but sometimes they want to take pictures. Or I know you want your family, but God. And my kids go, go ahead, Dad. It's okay. And they've always been like that since they was like three or four years old. And that gives me the, the peace to go, all right, let me take this time and smile and take this picture. Um, and um, and I go for, for certain things, I make time, like, Taking my daughter to NYU to, to, to walk the campus. And I took her, we went to about 12 schools and we walked the campus. And we w went to USC and we walked the campus. And some of these campuses, that's stuff that my, I have to do as a father with my child. And sometimes I get there late and I slide in and I walk around for a little while. And then I would break out early, but I was there so she can go, my dad was there. And to me, when you spend time and you don't have time, then that's precious time. Um, so, you know, I'm thankful for that. Although, you know, those colleges are expensive. I, I, <laughs> you know, in the father's dream, you go, USC, yes, my daughter. And then you see that bill and you go, oh, well, maybe, maybe we could go to UCCCC. <laughs> you question it. You're like, uh, don't you want to be an artist? <laughs> well, just go, don't go, you want to go to art. community school? Uh, Marlon, I'm such a fan. Thank you so much for being here. Woke hey, is on Netflix now. Yes. Uh, and and uh, your show as well. When can, how My show, Marlon, uh, it's coming in for a second season on NBC. It should be 
coming out, I think, probably April or May. So watch that on NBC. Please watch Wokish. Hit me on Instagram, at Marlon Wayans, Twitter, at Marlon Wayans, Facebook, Marlon Wayans fan page. Um, and let me know how you guys like the special. Um, I, I'm proud of it, and then the fan reaction has been – I I didn't know what to think, but, I mean, the fans are loving it right now. And so I'm, I'm very happy that I did something that people love. So – Please watch it, support it, and uh, thank y'all. I love y'all. The great Marlon Wayans, everybody. Let's hear it.